We have been doing Warbirds in Review for 20 years. My name is Connie Bolin. This was my brainchild years ago. Had no idea it would uh, turn into what it has today. That has happened because of the great support of many volunteers and the aircraft owners. I'll reflect on the 20 years a little by looking at this wildcat here. The owners of these aircraft, the people who fly them, maintain them, have always responded to my phone calls. Rod Lewis is a really perfect example of that. I called Rod several months ago and I said, hey Rod, Terrace, uh, that you'll meet here in just a little bit. Terrace uh, was a big part of the restoration of the, and the recovery of this airplane. When I called Rod and said we'd really like to feature it this year at Oshkosh, he said, I'll see what we can do. As a result of that, Conrad got the airplane uh, going and uh, it's here. And that is no small thing to ask. Uh, Rod Lewis, thank you if you're uh, listening or you hear this later. To the other people that provide their aircraft, I cannot thank them enough to the Scotch miracle Grow Company that gives us the financial support that allows us to do this. The Quonset hut behind me is Ron and Diane Fagan's contribution to what we do. They have an absolutely amazing museum in Granite Falls, Minnesota. If you ever have the opportunity to visit Fagan Fighters World War II Museum, you should make that. Uh, it's not exactly on the beaten path, but it is well, well worth it. So to all the volunteers, to our aircraft owners, to the people who make this possible, including the Sleeping Dog Productions team that records the uh, interviews and the parts of history that would otherwise be lost, uh, we now record them and uh, they will be here forever uh, when the rest of us are long gone. So our moderator for this program uh, is Sam Bass, my good friend Sam Bass, who was an Air Force pilot. Uh, we go way back. Sam has been a big part of this for the last 20 years also. We have a video uh, introduction. David Hartman has been a part of our program for many years, written and narrated much of it. Uh, the video, if you will direct your attention to the Jumbotron, that will be our intro video, and then Sam will come on board to introduce you to all of our guests. And we have a quite a distinguished lineup, as you see. So uh, good luck, Sam, in managing this many people, and I know it will be a great program. Thank you very much. In November 1910, Eugene Ely took off from a modified Navy cruiser on the Virginia coast flying a Glenn Curtis airplane. Two months later, Ely landed on a different ship in San Francisco Bay. Naval aviation was born. Training soon moved from Virginia to Pensacola, Florida, which is the cradle of naval aviation. Every naval and marine aviator to this day traces his or her start in flying to Pensacola. Every Navy aircraft ever flown is housed in the Naval Air Museum at NAS Pensacola. If you love airplanes, especially Navy airplanes, you will love visiting this incredible museum and its National Flight Academy for 7th to 12th graders on Fetterman Way at the museum. Navy planes dominated in the Pacific War. Fighters, the Grumman Cat series, the Wildcat, the Bearcat, the Tiger Cat, and the Hellcat. Hellcat pilots shot down over 5,000 Japanese airplanes in the Pacific. The late Alex Vashu, the Navy's fourth ranking ace, said that he loved his Hellcat so much that if it could cook, he'd marry it. East 
midst of the preceding scene in mid-continent. The USS Wolverine rides the choppy waters of Lake Michigan. The Wolverine, formerly the Lake Steamer C&B, has been converted for training purposes. Before the war, the Wolverine, a coal-burning sidewheeler, plied the stormy Great Lakes waters. Thousands of holiday passengers paraded her decks. Now she serves a grimmer purpose, training fighter pilots for all-out sky battle. A prime example of Yankee ingenuity in tooling up for war. Nearly 130 United States Navy aircraft were lost in Lake Michigan during World War II. The vast majority of accidents occurred in Lower Lake Michigan in an almost forgotten naval project which had trained approximately 15,000 aircraft carrier pilots to take off and land on two makeshift aircraft carriers between 1942 and 1945. The Navy considered Lake Michigan ideal for training its carrier pilots. It was situated in the middle of the United States, far from enemy submarines patrolling the eastern and western seaboards. Over the past 37 years, a small team of explorers have surveyed the southern basin of Lake Michigan in search of World War II U.S. Navy aircraft. They are on a race against time to save World War II era aircraft resting off the shore of Chicago. The team says marine life, corrosion, and naval bureaucracy are taking a toll on the underwater treasures. Close to 50 of those lost aircraft have been recovered. I guess the part that uh, most exciting is that my grandson sat in the plane when he pulled it out of the lake this morning. And he was the first person to sit in it since I vacated it 65 years ago. It's not just a matter of going out and snatching it off the bottom of the lake and bringing it ashore and sticking it in the restoration department. You have to do a National Environmental Policy Act survey. You have to get the Corps of Engineers involved. You have to get the State Historic Preservation Office involved. You have to get the Fish and Wildlife Commission involved. You have to get the Water Quality people involved. You have to get the Radiation Control people involved. It takes about a year to do the paperwork on this. One of the advantages of having an Army Ranger involved in this project is he won't take no for an answer. Author, historian, and adventurer, Taurus, is one of the leaders of a team that has recovered dozens of aircraft on behalf of the National and Naval Aviation Museum. So the aircraft you're looking at, this beautiful piece of machine, is a FM-2 Wildcat fighter built by Eastern Aircraft Division of General Motors under license from, from Grumman. In the late 1980s, the director of the National Naval Aviation Museum took a look at these assets and we began recovering their aircraft. This aircraft crashed December 28, 1944. It was under the control of a pilot named William Forbes, Ensign William Forbes. It was 15 degrees out, there was ice on the water, he was attempting his third takeoff and the engine failed. The ship actually hit the aircraft when it hit the water. Hard to understand how he survived because a ship that was 500 feet long, moving about 20 miles an hour, went right over the top of him. Taurus has said many times that we do this because it's our way of showing the present and future generations what the men and the women of the greatest generation did to preserve our liberty and freedom. Today, we have a magnificent example of this recovery and preservation work, the only flying model of a Wildcat F4F-3 from the Lewis Air Legends. Though it is the same type and variant and never saw combat, it is intertwined with one of the most fascinating and courageous characters of the war, Edward Henry Butch O'Hare. 
If the name sounds familiar, it's because Chicago's O'Hare Airport is named after the Navy's first flying ace and Medal of Honor recipient. Butch O'Hare is practically synonymous with the Wildcat. Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to Warbirds in Review 2020-2021. We're going to put them all together here. we got a great show today, and I'm going to be introducing our speakers here. This is Tyrus Lasenko, and he's written this book. It's called The Great Navy Birds of Lake Michigan, and it'll be available for sale over at the Merchandise Mart over here, and Tyrus will, will be up, glad to sign it for him, give you a little little note there, and he has his guest with him today. He will be conducting the program. He has his guest is Mark Clark, Dick Hansen, Steve Craig, Conrad Huffstadler. Did I say that right? That's pretty good then. And then Dave Kessler. Okay, now, Tarsley, you you own A&T Recovery, is that correct? 50% uh, owner, yes, A&T Recovery. I'm 50% owner, yes. Of, okay. I've got to adjust my mic. Oh, Sorry, yeah. okay, folks. Okay, good. 50% owner of A&T Recovery, yes. And it's, it, it's I'm, on the the it's, I'm the T. I'm the T. It's on the recovery and preservation of aircraft loss underwater, the Navy, over the over a period of time. So you've written this book. Now, would you go ahead with your program now? I will. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. First off, I'd like to thank the people who made this possible. Obviously, Sam. Uh, Connie, Kyle, Scott, uh, EAA Warbirds America, thank you for all you've done to put this, put this together. Uh, I need him to roll a film. Scott, can you roll that film for me, please? So, as you saw, you understand the, how the aircraft were lost. This aircraft, the reason we were able to secure it for private restoration was we had completed a contract for the National Naval Aviation Museum. And there's a thing in law, Title 10, United States Code, Section 2572. It's the law that allows VFW halls and that sort of thing to have tanks out front on loan. It also allows the exchange of military equipment to enhance the historic collections. And exchanging an aircraft such as, this, such as this that would go into private hands and be restored and shown to all of us is enhancement of military collections. So we had completed a contract, and the contract allowed us to have ownership of several of these aircraft. This one in particular was about 210 feet deep in Lake Michigan. So I'm going to do a little bit of diver kind of thing. This aircraft was very difficult for us to recover. And it was difficult for us to recover because it was standing upright, nose down, in about 210 feet of water. If you look at this aircraft, you'll see that there's not a single place that we can attach lifting points to pick it up. And we never sling an aircraft because you damage it. But up at the top, there is a lifting assembly. And that lifting assembly takes four Zeus fasteners to open the door, and then the lifting assembly is in there. If you're looking at the videotape, you can see our remotely operated vehicle attempting to open that little door. So at that point in life, I think I was 30 years old, and my partner and my main crew member, they're, they're a whole lot older than me. Actually, one of them sitting in there. You can take a look at them. They're really old compared to me. Anyway, so. So for months, we went out with their ideas and both of them trying to open that door so that we could get that lifting assembly. The reason for that is 210 feet deep, there's a thing called nitrogen narcosis, right? Which makes it very dangerous for us to dive, right? So most people describe nitrogen narcosis as being drunk. I describe it as being on a whole lot of Xanax except for you feel the pain. And what I mean by pain 
When you go to that depth, the water temperature is 38 degrees. And I don't care what type of gloves you have on or what type of hood you have on, suit you have on, within 10 minutes, you feel that 38 degrees. And it's excruciating painful. The thing about the nitrogen narcosis is that you don't care. All you want to do is go to sleep. And you forget what you're really doing there because you're looking at your freezing hands, thinking about your freezing ears, saying, I wish I could just lay down and sleep, right? So we tried for months to do that, to open it with the remote operated vehicle. You notice the nice tools we make? Pretty good, pretty good remote operated vehicle operator. To, it was either Keith or Al, and I think we got one of them open after about three or four months. So what happened was, Come November, Keith and I, who's in the audience, had had enough of the remote operated vehicle and we decided to dive to 210 feet. And my partner, Al, now there's another thing you have to notice, you see how dark it is? You can only see about that far where your light is pointed. So you don't have a perspective. So Keith and I decided to make that dive and my partner decided that we were gonna hook on to the tail tie-down of this aircraft. So Keith and I went down, we hooked on to the tail tie-down of the aircraft, and we actually lifted it that way, which picked the aircraft up like this. Now Keith is wonderful. You remember the Muppets where they had Beaker who did all the experiments? So we said, Keith, go down there and attach lifting assembly here. Well, we did that, which brought the aircraft upside down, then again, we sent Keith to what was now the underside of the aircraft to actually open up those Zeus fasteners and to get the lifting assembly. Pause, pause the video. Okay, so then you do that, but the divers have to hang on the line. They have to decompress. So did you see what Keith's talent he developed while hanging on the line? He became the world's leading expert in blowing bubble rings doing that, right? So <laughs> anyway, so we recovered that aircraft and a second aircraft in November of 1991, and I called my good friend, Mark Clark, and Mark Clark, I asked him to sell those aircraft for, you, for us. So I'm going to turn it over to Mark Clark because he's going to tell you what happened next. Thanks, Taurus. I have to say that being involved with these uh, Lake Michigan recovery airplanes is one of the highlights of Show my... 40-some year career in aviation sales, mostly warbirds down in Rockford. Uh, when Taurus called me, I, I knew this project was going on, so he said, well, we're going to have two wildcats in a warehouse kind of in downtown Chicago. So he says, you think you can sell them? And I said, yes, sir, I can sell those airplanes. So I kind of went through my customer list, and I, and I kind of identified some people that wanted restoration projects and wanted something unique that has a fantastic story. So I, I kind of picked up my top three people and I said, okay, let's go down to this warehouse. I don't remember the exact date, but I'll be down there early in the morning and you guys come down. So um, I called them and they, they came in and so we had the, 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 the first customer went in, uh, Mr. Kinsler here. He went in, he was, he was from the Detroit area. He came over early and went in and looked at the airplane and walked around it. And he said, well, I've got to kind of think about it a little bit. And I said, well, you can think about it as long as you want, but I have two other people that are interested in the airplane. And he says, oh, yeah, sure, right. About that time, there was a, I think my cell phone rang, and it was Mr. Hansen and his partner, Jim Porter. And Kinsler looked at me, and he says, oh, there's really somebody out there? And I said, yeah, there's really somebody out there. And I said, I've got somebody else who's coming up this afternoon. Yeah, Butch Schroeder from Danville, who restored a beautiful Mustang many years ago. So, uh, Dave, I, I, they're out there, Dave. And I, I told Hanson and Porter, I said, you guys have to wait. There's somebody in here already. So Dave says, okay, I'll take the airplane. Fine. Easy deal. About 15 minutes, and he decided yes. And So I went out the door, and Dave walked out the door, and I invited Mr. Hanson and Mr. Porter in. And I said, you have the choice of that one over there. He said, well, what about that one? I said, well, that guy just bought it. So, and I said, just remember, there's another guy coming yet today. So they walked around and, and looked at the airplane, and, and they ultimately purchased the second airplane. But is that 
that picture, that's that's the picture taken in the warehouse. The airplanes were still there. They smelled like an old aquarium. You could you could smell it, the, just the fishy smell. There was still water kind of dripping out of the airplanes. It, it was an amazing sight to see these airplanes that have been down there since during the war. And like I say, it was one of the most interesting projects I've been lucky enough to be involved in and in selling lots of interesting airplanes over the years. So I'll turn it over to Dave, and he can kind of tell you where his part began in involvement in the airplane. Okay. So um, Dave had one question for me. Um, and so I'm going to let you tell it, but I want to make sure he tells you about the question he had for me because you'll see what a perfect gentleman he is. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, my, uh, my name is Dave Kensler, and uh, I just got into Warbirds. If you guys are ever looking for an airplane, I had a pretty good uh, reference. I went to Paul Poberezny in 1988 and said, uh, you know, I'd like to get into Warbirds, but I don't know anything about them, and, you know, I'm a Bonanza driver. And, and he says, well, you should call Mark Clark at Courtesy Aircraft in Rockford, Illinois, where EAA started. And in the ensuing years, he and I have done uh, 13 uh, buy-sell transactions with Warbirds. And... Uh, I had just finished a T-28 that was in Honduras, for God's sake, and uh, had been put in a container ship and uh, sent to Houston, Texas. And I had just finished that plane, and uh, I, was, I said I was looking for a project, and I, I don't, I'm not a big hitter in this Warbird thing. I'm a little hitter, because I can't keep all my toys. I have to pass them on. So uh, he calls me up and says, we got this Wildcat, and I, and I had grown up and learned to fly by Kalamazoo Air Zoo. And I'd been to the Air Zoo and seen all the, the cats fly there. I learned to fly at Austin Lake, a little grass strip south of town. So I knew what a wildcat was, but I didn't know anything else. So I, I called my p company pilot and said, we're, we're, we got a mission. And I called my A&P and, and I said, we're, we're going to Chicago. And I go, Chicago, yeah, we're going to a warehouse in the south side of Chicago. I think uh, Al Capone owned it. And, uh, and so we get up at freezing cold. It's about 10. We fly into uh, MIGS, get a taxi. We go to this airport, and I walk in. And, and you saw the picture. Here are these two airplanes. And it's, if you ever saw the movie uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, it was exactly that. You go into these things, and these planes had the oxygen bottle still there. The, the, his oxygen mask was still there. The pencil was there. All this stuff, little notes and stuff in the plane. The, uh, the struts were up. It had gas in the gas tank. Oxygen bottle was full. All this stuff. And it was just sitting there, frozen, from June 1943 to December of 1991. And yeah, I got there first, uh, which is very fortunate because Dick Hansen is a uh, world famous warbird guy and uh, deep pockets and, and knows what he's doing. And he re had restored a P-40 that was on a gas station, uh, a sign on a highway out in Washington. I mean, that's this guy. So he and Porter are in the parking and I'm making him wait. and. Marcos, uh, no, I have a buyer looking at these planes, and I'm going, shit. And I got now, okay? I got now, and I know Schroeder's coming. I thought he, Dick would buy both of them. That's what I thought was going to happen, you know, parts or whatever. And uh, so I do what every married person does, and I've been married 49 years, and I called my wife and said, I got this airplane. It's a quarter of a million bucks. It's filled with mud. It's been in Lake Michigan for 48 years. And I can buy it right now or never. And she said, go for it. And forever that changed, changed my life. And now our airplane is on permanent display in Hawaii at the Ford Field Pacific Museum. 
And if you ever get a chance to go see it, I'd appreciate it. I also have brochures in case anybody's really interested in the minutia of this for free after we're done. Thank you. So he, he left a couple very key important things out. One is normally there's a magnesium part of the assembly on these aircraft. This aircraft, for some reason, the engine stayed on when we lifted it up. His aircraft, the engine didn't. So he demanded that I sign a contract with him that, I would, that we would recover the engine within six months. His aircraft was a lot deeper than this aircraft. We succeeded, and he, he, he and his A&P did a very interesting thing. When we recovered the engine, they immediately put it in a box truck, and the mechanics started disassembling it and putting everything in oil. So it was really, I thought that was kind of cool. But the thing that really pissed us off, because when he made his offer, I told Mark no, and I, Probably Mark remembers this. I in A&T Recovery, I'm the kind, gentle, sweet, understanding part of A&T Recovery. And so anyway, so I said no to his offer. And my partner said, hell no, tell him to get lost. Because his offer was, was that T-28. And it wasn't because it was a T-28. It's because it had the Michigan State goofy emblem on the back of it. Anyway, so... Mark finally convinced me to say yes, and then Mark had to fly it with me and him back, so we, we accepted it. Anyway, so then, Mr. Hansen and Mr. Porter came in, so it's your stage. Okay, is this working? Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Or maybe this one would be better. Okay, good. Well, <laughs> my good friend from the Aurora Airport and I were invited, as you heard from Mark, to go look at this. And as soon as we walked in, uh, we were amazed at the condition of these underwater artifacts. It took us less than seven minutes to create a partnership to restore it. And, uh, and we did, in fact, of course, accomplish that. And amazingly, the condition of these airplanes was so good that we didn't have to clean out the inside or we didn't have to repaint the inside of the fuselage. We just scrubbed it up. Uh, the uh, wheels came up when you cranked them up. Uh, with the chain and there was air in one tire we put the air chuck on the other one and it pumped it up and we used them for the restoration period uh, as Dave mentioned there was a pilot's O2 in the oxygen tank and uh, the uh, battery we took out and poured water out and put electrolyte in it took a charge and the uh, uh, plexiglass was so good we reused it and I think that's Windshield screen is the original plexiglass, unless they've replaced it. And the, uh, the, the airplane was so clean in the cockpit, there was hardly any silt after 48 years in the water. And amazingly also, that the uh, pilot's glare shield, which was a rubber, or I'm sorry, a leather glare shield, was flexible and we reused that. Everything in the cockpit except the throttle quadrant was reused and many of the electrical termination boxes we could reuse. And we did do testing on the metal to make sure it was sound. And there was no corrosion inside the landing gear. The fuselage had hardly any corrosion in it. Uh, the wings, however, were not made by Grumman. They were subcontracted out. And they did not have the same corrosion protection that Grumman was famous for. So the wings uh, had corrosion inside the box bars. And... Uh, they were remanufactured by Ezel Aviation in Breckenridge, Texas. And the main restoration was done by Blackhawk Aviation in Janesville, Wisconsin. And as I say, the airplane was in such good shape that we were able to get it airborne from the time it came out of the water in less than two and a half years. Uh, and uh, we didn't ha reuse the engine. We were able to get a, 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 another engine and, uh, d from a, you know, a DC-3 type. And the uh, original airplane had an electric propeller. We could not find one, so we put a hydraulic propeller on it. Uh, and in an interesting human relations standpoint, I wanted to see if the pilot who put it in the water was still alive. And we had his name, we had the accident report. He was blamed for not having the throttle all the way forward. But the underwater pictures that Taurus took showed the throttle quadrant all the way forward. Uh, and we, since we had his name and we found out that the, uh, he had gotten a civilian pilot's license when he was discharged from the Navy, 
So we had a social security number. I wrote a letter to the social security department and explained to them if he was still in their system, would they please forward this letter to him, self-addressed and so forth, or a stamped letter, and explain why. And of course, I never heard from them. But then maybe a month and a half later, I got a telephone call from John Forsberg and he was, in fact, alive. In fact, he lived in Chicago, suburban, sub, suburban Arlington Heights. And I called Jim Porter. We went over and visited him. And he was so pleased to see that he was not at fault, as they said in the accident report. We showed him the picture. And the first thing his wife said is, see, John, I told you all these years, you were right, and they were wrong. So, and uh, we had the airplane... Uh, I got to fly for about 65 hours and Jim Porter for about 25. And then uh, we uh, were able to turn the airplane over to Steve. Let me see. So um, I want to tell you how small the world is. And he mentioned uh, it's Black Hawk Aviation. Uh, I'm a registered federal lobbyist, and back about 10, 15 years ago, I'm walking down one of the halls of the, uh, of the house office buildings. And coming down the other way is the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. You remember him? Paul Ryan. And he looks at me and he says, you look really familiar. And I said, okay. And I said, yeah, maybe. Maybe you saw me in the news. I'm the guy who recovers the World War II aircraft. And he says, I saw that Wildcat fighter at Black Hawk Aviation. And I don't know if he was in college and might have had a job there or whatever. I don't know. But he knew who I was. Based on, and he knew this aircraft. So anyway, um, so that's how small the world is, right? Um, so you and Mr. Porter sold it to Mr. Craig, right. and I'll leave it to you. Go ahead. Tell him the story. Well, well thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be here, and thanks to everyone for your interest in, in history. Um, and um, what I can say is that uh, I look back, the year was 1994, and I'm pretty certain that was the year, Dick. And when uh, this plane, I was here at Oshkosh with my 10-year-old son and um, his first time at Oshkosh. And I walk out onto the Warbird flight line and uh, I just dreamed that maybe someday I might have a, a Warbird of some kind. Um, I was in the Staggerwing Club and group and uh, I had a Staggerwing project, but it was a long way from being ready. And... Um, I knew of Dick Hansen, of course, and uh, but I didn't really know him that well. But uh, but I knew him, and in 1994, I'm here when um, when a, a great guy, uh, Bill Dodds, taxied in with Dick and Jim's airplane, and uh, I'm just fascinated by, uh, in particular, this airplane and its history. I had spent some time in the Navy, a naval reservist, and uh, spent time at Pensacola, and that's another long story. But I had, um, uh, I knew Navy history pretty well, and I, I knew about the first two years of the war and, and what an incredible um, presence the, the F-4F Wildcat uh, made in, in, in those first two years of the war. So I was, and then I was totally fascinated by how original this plane appeared to be. And, uh, and talking to Bill Dodds and then later Dick Hansen. And, uh, but again, I never imagined that I would uh, own this airplane and get to fly it for nine and a half years. And, and the privilege of being able to fly it and demonstrate it here at Oshkosh in 2004, I think 2007, um, other in California and other parts of the country. Um, always being incredibly well received by uh, people. And of course, now here we are in 2021, and many of those people aren't here anymore uh, that I can still imagine and see myself out there on that flight line. And thanks to uh, Rod Lewis and Conrad Hussettler, I was privileged to be able to sit in the plane again for the first time just this morning. But to be there and, and just be standing there and dressed about like this and have, uh, and this would be 2003, 4, uh, up until the time that 
that Rod Lewis acquired the plane from me. And, and, and the scene would typically be every time. Here'd come an older man uh, with his family. And, um, and the scene would unfold like this time and time again. Um, and as they approached the plane, uh, maybe a, a granddaughter, a grandson, or a son or daughter would say, is this what you flew in the war? And the man would say, yes, that, that's the plane I flew. And then a comment like, um, uh, well, it, looks, it seems bigger than we imagined it. Or, and then pretty soon maybe some, they'd look around and I'd be standing there observing, uh, can you tell us about this airplane? I'd say, sure, I, I can tell you some things about it. And then at that point, pretty soon, would you be the pilot? And I said, well, yes, I am. And uh, those experiences, and I could sit here for the next many hours talking about them. And, um, and of course, I, I think that's um, why you're here, why we're here. Uh, and, um, and, and it was um, a tremendous honor and a tremendous privilege to be able to fly that airplane and tribute uh, to our veterans, not just the aviators, but really all our veterans and their families. So one of the things you saw in the video was I say we do this to present it to the present and future generations. So thanks to these gentlemen and Mr. Lewis, we have passed it on to the next generation. Conrad, it's your stage. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, well, I'm ecstatic to be here this year, and uh, I'm so proud to bring this airplane with me. Uh, I want to thank uh, Lewis Air Legends for trusting me with this one-of-a-kind airplane and letting me wrench on it and, and, and bring it up here so all y'all could see it. Uh, Rod Lewis owns the airplane now. Lewis Air Legends maintains it. Uh, he does a really good job of keeping it happy and healthy, and, and uh, we're so happy that it's out flying around. We're able to bring it up here to Oshkosh and show it off. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the airplane itself. It's uh, There's probably about 13 Wildcats flying right now, and all of those, except for this airplane, were not built by Grumman. They were built by General Motors. So this airplane is rare in the fact that it is a true Grumman-built Wildcat, and it is the earliest variant, the F4F-3. So the wings do not fold. Uh, it's got a twin row 14 cylinder uh, Pratt and Whitney 1830 so it's a bit of a different engine that we're what we're used to on the Wildcat uh, I had the, the pleasure when I was a little younger 21 to 24 years old to rebuild an FM2 Wildcat and I got to bring it up here to Oshkosh in 2013 and we did a uh, we did a shotgun start had a had a fun time with it but it didn't carry the history that this airplane does this airplane uh, fought ahead, the war in the early years when this was all we had. So uh, I don't think the Wildcat gets enough uh, attention. We all like to focus on the Mustangs and the Corsairs. But in fact, this was our only fighter uh, entering the war. And it, it kind of carried us for the first couple of years. So I'll leave it at that. I'd, I'd love to talk about it and answer questions. And We've got time for a few questions and answers. Anybody got a question? Let me say something you, quickly. You want to do one? Okay. So um, one of the things I'm always asked when I'm interviewed by the media, they always say, how many people does it take to do what you do? And they're talking about my crew at A&T Recovery. Well, that's not how many people it takes. To do what we do, it takes thousands and thousands of people. The equipment, the technology, the restorers, the historians, and they all have to act together. And I always say, all those people are my family. So I'm going to ask you guys to do something right before this ends. And it's the most sane thing you've ever heard. After we're done with the questions, these gentlemen and I are going to go right there and I want a group photo with all of you who are part of our family. You guys in f up for it? So wherever the professional photographers are, get ready to take that photo. Now we're ready for a few questions, and then we'll do that photo, OK? First, little lady here. Right behind you, or up there. 
Yeah, I, I wonder if you would just expound on, uh, you took a survey of the of the this area, the bottom of Lake Michigan, to find out what particular aircraft were down there. Was that a bartering chip to take possession of this aircraft? Because I know the Navy, as far as they're concerned, it's ours in per perpetuity wherever it lays. And I guess unlike the Air Force, you know, if you recover something, you have to kind of have a deal, I don't know if it's official or under the table, in exchange for taking... Yeah, the Navy, the Navy lost it, so it's the Navy. So you're right, it was a bartering chip. a t Recovery side scan surveyed the southern basin of Lake Michigan and located the aircraft. So it was a bargaining chip. We were the only people who knew where they were. Next question. A question for Tara also. Um, you had said earlier that approximately 130 aircraft had been lost in Lake Michigan and approximately 50 have been recovered. Actually more 50 by in, in what I would consider contemporary from 1975 until present day. They actually had a recovery operation during the war where they recovered uh, aircraft that crashed in shallow water. So I estimate 10 to 15 they recovered in, during the war. So um, I think there's about 60 to 70 still on the bottom. How many of those would you estimate are recoverable? Uh, with, the, with the involvement of the Naval History and Heritage Command, none. It's a shame. And those of you who know, the Naval History and Heritage Command is the most bureaucratic, communist, socialist, uh, can you tell my political leanings, uh, organization in the U.S. government that ever existed. <laughs> They're telling me to stop. Anyway. <laughs> I think one of the one of the things that is this go ahead. Or, yeah, I guess I'm on. I think one of the things that Taurus, in the progression of recovering these airplanes, has discovered the guaga mussels, zebra mussels, and pollution and stuff um, is getting worse, and these airplanes are deteriorating at an increasingly fast rate. Yeah, they they squeak uric acid like we do, so the aircraft are in a uric acid bath all the time now. But the archaeologists there think, oh, they're in situ, and we're watching them corrode to nothing, and we're learning something. Yeah, right. Okay. Go ahead. The, there's, and then the youth behind you also. Go ahead. Well, thank you for what you do, restoring all these warbirds. Um, I think that's something great that you all do. But I wanted to know if this is uh, Butch O'Hare's um, paint scheme for the, his wildcat. Wait, could you repeat that? Is this uh, Butch O'Hare's uh, paint uh, scheme for his wildcat, or is this um, another wildcat? Yeah. Um, so this Wildcat obviously isn't Butch O'Hare's actual airplane, but it was painted as accurately as possible to represent his airplane. Um, w one of the really interesting things that happened recently is, I believe Paul Allen did a expedition and found the USS Lexington, the original USS Lexington, that had sunk. And they got a bunch of really neat pictures, and I, I recommend you go look them up. But on the bottom of the ocean, you can see Butch O'Hare's actual wildcat, still in great condition and uh, quite deep down. I've seen that picture. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for what We'd you did. We'd like to recover that. <laughs> Someone else, please? While she's walking up, is there anybody over here? Surely you've got some questions. This is fascinating. There's a lady right over here. How many uh, more wildcats are you going to bring up and redo in Lake Michigan? We, we would like to recover five to ten more SPD Dauntlesses and wildcats. We would like to. We think there's a demand for them. Oh, by the way, you've seen the SPD Dauntless behind you, so a lot of us will be at the book signing and over there, so a lot of you can come and talk to us individually. Okay? One... Just a minute, please. Harold, I think it was, how do you climb in? Carefully. Oh, yeah, how I'll do you climb in I'll go demonstrate it for you. <laughs> the Wildcat sits pretty high off the ground, so they built it for 18-year-old kids to be hopping in. So I'm getting to the point where i got to flex pretty well. You kick into it, put a hand on, and then jump up on it. Youth is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Conrad was uh, three years old when this airplane was recovered. <laughs> right there in the front. Next question. Kyle, right in the front. Back here. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Up back there. 
Can you comment on the participation of this plane in the Battle of Midway? No, it was you. No. No, this doesn't have a combat history at all. You can hold it. It, it, it doesn't have a history, but the, the type aircraft is the type that would have been in that battle. How much time did it have on it when it, when it went to water? Oh, you would have to ask that kind of question. I don't know. He, oh, you know how much time on this one? No. Not on this plane. On my airplane, which is 12296, it was actually 70 days old when it went into the lake. It had less than 50 hours since new. If any of the I, I, uh, this airplane uh, was 13 months old when it went in, and uh, I think it flew in uh, anti-submarine patrol off Melbourne, Florida, before it went to uh, Great Lakes NTC for uh, carrier training. It was a senior citizen. Someone else? Uh, machine guns on it. What do you do about the weapons? The, there's a very interesting story about what we did with the actual machine guns. And to this day, I'll probably get in trouble if I ever tell it. The, uh, the machine guns that were on our airplane are actually at the, at the Pensacola Navy Museum on display. They were taken out of the plane. They were still soaked in cosmoline. They had never been fired. All right, I'll tell the story. They left them in there for, they had them in there for weight and balance. So it, it would fly the same as it would in combat. Okay, so I'll tell the story, real short. Um, normally we recover the aircraft, they have all the armaments on them. We ship the whole aircraft with the armaments down to Pensacola. These two aircraft had their machine guns. They were our aircraft. Therefore the machine guns were given to us as well. So I can't have an automatic weapon. So I took the machine guns out, I called the director of the National Naval Aviation Museum and I said I have a bunch of machine guns sitting here. He said, ship them down to us. What? He said, ship them down. So Keith and I, who's up there, he'll, he'll talk to you. We put them in a box and I call the shipper. And, and shipping is classifi they're cl it's classified. And I said to the ship, they said, what do you have? And I said, use machine parts. <laughs> <laughs> the driver came, picked it up, took it down to Mobile, Alabama, and I got a call from the boss down at the distribution center in Mobile, Alabama for the shipping company. He said, what's in these boxes? I think it's classified wrong. And I said, do me a favor. Go on to the naval base and open the box there. The call I got from that man about four hours later, I'm used to people yelling at me because of my history. I had my phone about this far away, and it was still breaking my eardrums. And I. I asked him one question. Did you open the box on the naval base? He said, yeah, I will never, ever talk to you again in your entire life, you son of a bitch. <laughs> so anyway, that's what happened. <laughs> Next. I just have a quick question. You said there are 60 or 70 aircraft still on the bottom. Um, how many of those are Dauntlesses and Wildcats? And I know there are some Avengers down there, too. Yeah, it, uh, Avengers the, have gotten really popular. The major percentage is, is Avengers, TBFs, T, TBMs. Um, I, don't, I never have these numbers in my head. I, I can't remember my girlfriend's birthday, so you know, it's, I, I don't have those numbers. A, a dozen or so, I don't know. Yeah. So. Any more? Kyle, behind you. Kyle. You said you're going to be at the Dauntless. Is that one you guys brought up too? Yes, we recovered that in 1994. It's right behind us. It's right behind us, yeah. Is there any more up here that you guys have recovered this year? A any more here to show? Yeah. No, 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 there's these two. Okay, thank yeah. you. Hey, that's enough, isn't it? Kyle? It's a lot of work bringing these things here. Conrad spent like 1,400 hours getting this one here. That, that thing, oh, that was a nightmare getting here. I'm, I'm just very curious, before they transitioned to the Hellcat, were there any variants to this Wildcat that had hydraulic assist as far as cranking up the, uh, the landing gear, or were they all manual? They, they were all oh. manual. How, how many cranks is it, you guys? 29. 29. 20, yeah. 29. While you're taking off. 
It's kind of a... It's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A, well, wait, but you got to make sure the cro- throttle doesn't creep back, and then you're pulling up on the stick. Yeah, it, and it's a busy it. cockpit after takeoff. You <laughs> you pitch up, and you're trying to keep a real high deck angle to keep your speed low so that you can crank up the gear. Uh, the faster you go, the harder it is to crank. So you pitch up, you keep it pretty slow. You're pushing a whole bunch of right rudder to offset torque. You're cranking up the gear, and when you crank the gear, you're you're pulling your head down. So you peek up and make sure you're going the right direction and go back down and crank it up. Um, but no, they there was really never a, a assist on that gear. Uh, they had different variations of the indications, but the gear mechanism stayed just about the same. And that whole landing gear came from the uh, flying boats. You know, that was a very easy way to do it in the flying boats, and then it transferred into the the very first, you know, monoplanes. How, do, how does it handle on the ground with the narrow mains? You know, a, a lot of people uh, say the Wildcat's really hard to fly, but the tail wheel locks straight, so directionally it's, it's not that bad. Where the fun comes in is the oleo struts. The oleo struts, being a carrier-based fighter, they wanted a lot of deflection so you could plop it down on the, on the deck. Well, the struts are so close to the center line of the airplane that if a strut collapses or uh, reduces in length, you get a big bank. So a lot of what we're doing when I'm turning onto the runway or positioning the airplane is trying to get the struts into a position where the wing's down into a crosswind or uh, just properly oriented before takeoff or landing. So the left crosswinds are especially bad because you're fighting torque and if you turn left onto the runway and get the left wing high with left crosswind it's uh, it's a bad combination so there's a lot more thought that goes into to takeoffs and landings but it really isn't a difficult airplane to keep on the runway see how easy <laughs> so it doesn't have any hydraulic system at all in just the brakes just the brakes yeah the brakes. next Right there. I can't. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for bringing this, the airplane here. And uh, uh, this commentary is uh, amazing. And uh, I lo- love the panel discussion and everything. Um, I was curious. I'm always curious about operational losses versus combat losses. And uh, they always seem very high. And I, hello? Uh, I was curious if, um, if when these airplanes went off the end of the Wolverine, and I think it's the Sable. Yes. Um, yeah. Was there a common reason why they went off? And well, I, I've studied the accident cards and everything else for a long time. And put this in perspective, I don't know how many hours, I think there's a Navy pilot or two in here, I don't know how many hours it is that a modern day Navy pilot goes to simulators and everything else. I looked at the records on these things. If they had 350 hours flying, they were experienced pilot, right? So there was, that was the first thing. And then they will tell you about the, the torque and the P factor, how hard that was. And then they were flying these things over and over and over and the maintenance was a nightmare. So the 130 losses to me after qualifying about 15,000 pilots seemed like a pretty good record. It's less than 1%. What's that? That's less than 1%. Yeah, it's a small percentage for people who, it, think about that for a second. Who would go to land on an aircraft carrier with only 350 hours? Yeah, they did. So, but then again, they were 18, 19 years old, invincible. I wouldn't trust the average 18, 19 year old now with a remote control of a TV. But, so. we oh, got, I'm sorry, I shouldn't talk like that. We got question for one more question. Okay. Time for one more. Anybody? Somebody's got to be way last. up in the corner there. I want to say real quick the there was one. I, I don't know if y'all read that crash report, but um, the gear handle was accidentally the switch was hit and it wound up the headset cord and he. He went off and ditched into the water, uh, but it was due to that gear crank. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah. Oh, there was all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah. 
Our our Go plane ahead. went our plane went into the lake because of prop governor failure and had a Curtis electric propeller. And it's a very similar story to Dick's pilot. Our, our pilot, George Hahn, I found him. I had he and his wife here at Oshkosh in 95. And he asked, when I called him on the phone, <clears throat> I said, George, I've got your plane. It's going to fly again. And he goes, who is this? <laughs> and, and I said, no, George, I've got your plane. I've been working on it for two and a half years. And he and he didn't believe me. Once he finally did, the first question, the first question he asked me, everything was up, wasn't it? <laughs> and I said, yes, it was up. And he, I knew it. <laughs> and nobody knew this story but my wife. And I sent him a framed picture of his throttle quadrant calciumed in place exactly the way it was supposed to be. Got one more here? Yeah, I do. Um, thanks again, guys, for what you do. It's really impressive. Um, I wanted to know if any of you have had a chance to fly any other warbirds, uh, particularly fighters. No, and, never. No, nobody <laughs> okay. right now. Nobody and, else, so. and, you know, this was one of our first in the Pacific. And how does, what are some of the biggest differences you see between this plane and some of the other ones you might have flown? Dick, Steve? Dick? Well, this, of course, wasn't as fast as a Mustang. Was a <clears throat> P-40 was a little faster than this. Uh, but this was pretty maneuverable. You could do a really fast roll, left and right. Uh, but the only way you could get away from a Jap Zero in those days was to dive it straight down. And the, many of the losses took place because they had been taught, the early fighter pilots, had been taught to dogfight a la World War I, and that was a, the, uh, the, the problem they had they were early P-40s and with these. But once they realized that the Jap Zero can't turn right in a steep dive at high speeds, they were able to get away from them. I would, I would just make one quick comment. Um, I, I flew this plane for five or six years before I acquired a Mustang and flew it. And... Um, and my check out in the Mustang from a guy that uh, felt I had more capability, really, than I did. And so I got a quick check out out in California. And I flew the Mustang, but, and I'd done some stalls and a loop and a roll and a few things. And he said, oh, you're good to go. I didn't even bounce once on the landings. But I didn't have it up here. And I think any pilot in this room knows when you don't have it up here, you don't have it. And so, uh, so I knew Lee Lauterbach, and uh, so I decided to go to Stallion. And so this can be a long story, but I got a, an abbreviated checkout, thanks to Lee and a great instructor named John Pawson. But the Mustang has a vicious stall. There's just no question about it. This thing stalls like a 172 or a 182. It's just a sweetheart. Uh, but a Mustang, if... if um, if you get a big skid going um, and, um, and you depart the airplane, you're, uh, you're in for Mr. Toad's wild ride, I can tell you that. And so, um, so that's one major difference between a, certainly a, a laminar flow fighter yeah, like I, a Mustang. Magnificent airplane, magnificent fighter, but this plane is go. a sweetheart to fly. Let me tell you a, an interesting needle ball airspeed kind of story with the Mustang down at Lee Lauterbox, my partner and I and our Mustang were getting checked out and uh, we were at 8,000 feet and he said oh now we're going to do a, a landing stall from base to final so gear and flaps down bring it back until it stalls and recovers well both my partner and I were good needle ball pilots and we both had the ball in the center and when it paid off it went down maybe 350 400 feet with a 45 degree wing slant and we recovered uh, which would have been survivable if you're flying pattern altitude he said all right most of my customers don't know how to keep the ball in the center so purposely keep it half out so the next time we did it kept it half out we were in a 30 degree left hand bank and the ball half out and it rolled 135 degrees the other way and went down 1600 feet that has killed a lot of pilots so that's the mustang you had to be careful with this one is really so gentle, it's often called the mild cat. 
I want to thank all you folks for coming out. Uh, you had a unique experience with this airplane, and we really appreciate all your guys' time. Thank you very much. Are you ready for a photo? There we go.